sit down, so there we go. How does it feel walking into the cinema knowing they've all just watched your new film? Uh, very nerve-wracking. <laughs> nice response, though. Yeah, it's hard to tell. There's so many people. There's lots of people I haven't seen here in a long time. There's actually the crew of the movie also here. Oh, right? well, a round of applause for the crew of the movie. Congratulations. That's wonderful. Um, I'm going to get to the questions that are coming in, but I'm going to start things off. What did you What did you set out to do with this film? What did you What did you want it to be? What did you want to create with it? <laughs> Am I allowed to swear? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? I was hoping it's just. Late. I, mean, I had a drink just to calm my nerves down. I've been doing publicity tour for the last week. <laughs> it's been a nightmare. Um, I just wanted to make, I trying to make a film that wasn't, you know, shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you achieved that, for sure. <laughs> my, my dad's here, he's probably like, well, let's see about that. <laughs> I've got a few notes. The, the journey of this started quite a long time ago, didn't it, Bill, in terms of the idea of this film? And, and yeah. It was like, it was probably 2018 when I first started trying to write the first draft. And so, yeah, AI was a distant dream then, like flying cars and living on the moon. It was not supposed to happen. And I picked 2070, because, you know, even Stanley Kubrick got it a little bit wrong in 2001. Um, and so I was like, if I pick 2070, I'll probably be dead then. And no one can say I'm an idiot. And I already look like an idiot. Because I probably should have picked like 2024, 2025. <laughs> Did you do much research into that side of things, you know, in terms of like where where that side of the world may go in terms of, of, of AI? Because it's such a human story, but obviously they're part of that story and the journey of AI is part of that story. So when writing it, did you do like a load of research into where that's going, what that future is? I'm going to say yes. I did loads and loads and loads of research. Um, there wasn't that as there wasn't as much material as there is today. And I remember there was one story that really stood out on a podcast about AI. And this lady was basically doing an experiment to see if we would accept, you know, AI as equals. And so she bought these really sophisticated. They were I think they were toy bunnies that could talk and walk and interact with you. And she gave them to people, and they had to spend like 15 minutes chatting to this thing. And then she gave them a sledgehammer and said, if you smash that bunny up, I'll give you $100. And no one could do it. No matter who she did it with, no one wanted the $100. They, and even though they would know, like, there's no, nothing alive in there, there's no soul. Um, it's something about human nature. We sort of anthropomorphize objects. You know, like, I'll speak to my car when it's struggling up a hill, or yeah. I even, like, say please and thank you to Siri on my phone, and stuff like that. <laughs> Like, just in, when the robo-pocalypse comes, which... You've been nice to them. Yeah. They'll be nice I'm going to be spared, because I made this film. <laughs> <laughs> that was what I was really up to. <laughs> was the intention always to have to, with the journey in terms of how you made it, in terms of shooting in real locations and almost reversing the process, was that, was that from the off how you wanted to make this film? Yeah, I think when you make a movie, for me, the process of making the film is as important as the idea. And um, I'm like a lot of people, when I made my very first movie, it was incredibly low budget, and we had to just wing it. Uh, uh, Jim Spencer, who was the producer on that first film, is in the building somewhere, probably the set. Where's Jim? Yeah. How are you, Jim? Hey, is it a wave at the back there? <laughs> um, yeah, so um, we went around Central America on like a bus and, uh, a little, and, and just sort of shot everything. We had all these happy accidents. Any, anytime we saw an amazing location, we jumped out, filmed it. And it was kind of a very creative experience. And then I got sort of teleported to the World Cup final and got to do Godzilla and Star Wars. And I felt like there's got to be this more sweet, like holy grail version of filmmaking where you get all the freedom of like an independent film, but all the scope and scale of a big blockbuster. And, and so I was just trying to find a studio crazy enough to sort of jump on board and do, like, we went to eight different countries. We went to the Himalayas in Nepal. We went to volcanoes in Indonesia, jungles of, like, you know, Cambodia and flowing villages in Thailand, everywhere. We traveled 10,000 miles during the pandemic. It was a little bit insane. We kind of did the journey the characters did. Mm -hmm. And then the idea being that we, instead of designing the world first, because normally you're chasing crazy, ambitious, world-building designs, 
and it costs $300 million. And so we sort of thought, we'll design it at the end. So let's just go shoot the film, see what happy accidents happen, see what amazing places we find, cut the movie together. And about halfway through, then we started designing it and basically got frames, you know, kind of exported them. I was just screen grabbed from my laptop and would give them to uh, the production designer, James Klein. And he would just sit and paint and we'd do zooms and like watch his desktop. And it was like one of my most fun parts of the process. But we'd just like try experiments with crazy weird things in the background and, and then give that to Industrial Light and Magic and say, go make that look real. Come on, this is what you do. And, um, and they did. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was kind, of, kind of back to front. I mean, some of the, the kind of things that are created in the films, where they're so beautiful, they should almost be like in a, you know, in a, in a museum or an art gallery, whether it be the, the kind of spaceships or, or the kind of, um, the, like the historical buildings that are, have been changed towards, you know, the AI with those carvings that we see in that beautiful temple at the end and things like that. Is that part of it that you enjoy with your, you know, with your background as well? in terms of that kind of thing of creating all these things and yeah and you're riffing off what's really there mm. so for instance that temple just to pick on that for a second that's a real temple in uh, phuket and um it's all wooden carved i think it's taken like 30 years to do and and so like the obvious thing when you turn up there you see all these statues kind of carved out of um like i guess uh they were kind of like buddhist you know thai uh carvings and and in your head, you're like, well, that's going to be a robot. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I'm trying to get these nice, nice dolly shots, like just picking on different areas. And we do like seven of them. And then we don't know till in post-production which one will like turn into robots. And, and we weren't allowed to, you know, we basically weren't, because it was wood, the whole thing, we weren't allowed to have an explosion or even a, a candle. <laughs> and the whole set piece was candles all around the bed, you know, that she was um, kind of on the life support with. And we were like, oh shit. And so we sent out the team um, and just they bought every single battery operated candle, you know, the fake one, yeah. Yeah. in the whole of Thailand. <laughs> and quickly brought them to the set and put them around everything. It was, it was kind of, it was a lot of stuff like that. Wow. And um, we've got some great questions coming in as well. Um, we're going to go to, let's go to Italy first, um, to Sarah, who says, how was directing such a young actor into those deep emotions? Madeline's extraordinary in this film. Can you tell everybody how old she was when you filmed this? 28. <laughs> she's got, you know, she's very small. <laughs> she was seven. Seven years old. Oh. Oh. Wow. She's nine now. Who cares? She's nine. <laughs> she was she's seven. lived that life. Yeah. Um, yeah, she was, I would love to take credit for like, I did some horse whispering and amazing direction. And, but this was all Madeline, like, she was incredible. We had an audition, we opened it to the whole world. There was hundreds of tapes sent in. She was the first girl through the door that we did an audition with and she did this like performance that made you want to cry. And I, it was too good to be true. And she was with her mum, who's this lovely lady, Annie. I didn't know her at the time. And I thought, oh, the mum must be playing a trick. I bet you the mum told her a puppy died just before she pushed her into the room. And, and like, you know, that's why she's doing it. So I, I kind of cheered her up. We chatted about other things, played a game. And then we're like, hey, let's do another scene. And I just tried to get her to do something similar. And she was even better. And she just left the room and we looked at each other like, oh my God, like this is what you dream of. Because I hate films, no offense to most of them, but I hate films with little kids in. <laughs> they, they can be so annoying. Apart from E.T. What? No, there, there's a handful that are amazing like that you know, where, where they look out and they've got amazing kids and they're classics, obviously. Yeah. But there's a lot that don't get so lucky <laughs> with the casting. And it was like, if we don't find the right kid, we probably shouldn't do the film. And, and thank God, you know, we found Madeline, so. And had you already cast John David at that point as well? I think so, yeah, I think so. Why was he the, the, the right casting for this? I mean, he's fantastic in this role. Yeah, well, we, we, it was during the pandemic and we had like a short list of people that we we're thinking about. And John David was so down to earth. He was like, he just wanted to meet, let's just have a chat wherever you want to go. And so they, some agents organized some Ponzi hotel, restaurant, five star nonsense. And we both felt really stupid going there. And we sat down and he came in with a, um, you know, we both had masks on because it was a pandemic. 
Um, and then he, his had a Star Wars logo on his. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, he's doing this because of Rogue One, bless. And then, <laughs> and then he sat down, he went, um, obviously it was a point of conversation. He said, oh, I'm really sorry. I, I've been wearing this every day the whole pandemic. I haven't taken it off. I'm a massive Star Wars fan. And I thought about not wearing this meeting because it's stupid. And he was like, and I thought it'd be false to do that. And so we just hit it off straight away. And we had this three hour amazing conversation about what we loved about, you know, films and, and also like performances and the idea of doing a hero that isn't afraid to expose themselves and show all this vulnerability and weakness and everything. And he was totally up for that. And he was the nicest guy in the world. And then on the drive home, I was like, I've got to call my team when I get in. They're going to ask how the meeting went. And Tennant was out at the cinema during the pandemic. And so basically every, every cross, like every basically traffic light I pulled up at, massive John David Washington <laughs> stood looking at me with a gun. <laughs> like he was like, you better fucking cast me. <laughs> and it just like nine times by the end, he was like, all right, I'm gonna do it. Uh, we're getting to go to Germany now. Hello, Mr. Edwards. Uh, my name is Mia Nemimik. I would be very interested to know where you got the idea for this emotional, touching and creative story about being human. Thank you very much for this incredible film. I think you can see quite clearly this is a whole, this is borrowing from so many of the amazing films um, that inspired me. Um, it's kind of a love letter to all those movies I grew up in cinema that I've sort of missed recently a little bit. Um, I've forgotten the question. You kind of answered <laughs> Did it. Did I answer it? Oh, well yeah. done. Nice. <laughs> nice question. We'll go on to James Lister in London who says, how do you go about designing AI robots? It's a brilliant design. Oh man, you're standing on the shoulders of giants when you have to do a robot design. So many brilliant ones have been done. Um, I don't know if they're in here, but um, like... <laughs> I mean, Ex Machina, obviously. Um, Chris Cunningham's a fucking genius, um, and his work is so inspiring from you know design point of view. You can't escape that. Um, also, like basically, most robots, you remove the ears. You know, they're just a simple head. And the second you do that, you're kind of missing a circle on the side of the head. And so, I what I really wanted to do was um, do something where it couldn't have been makeup. So, like basically, punch a hole through the hole. And and we also experimented with a lot of things where I found that. When you left the throat in, like when you left the skin of the throat in, if you removed it, it was like a mask. It was a little bit unnerving, like someone who was decapitated, and it made you a little bit suspicious of the person. Mm -hmm. And the second you leave the, the skin to connect into the body, um, you can kind of hug them again. And it was interesting, like we really needed the our AI to be likable, like lovable, to be honest. And so we that kind of defined a lot of it. And it all, you're always just riffing off shapes. You think you can invent anything, but if you do any old shape on the side of a head, you reject it. Like you've got to sort of follow the contours, and and also like we were borrowing from a lot of '80s um, product design, like like Sony Walkman and Nintendo, and sticking all that stuff in there. Well, that whole opening to the film, you know, in terms of that sort of almost the newsreel type thing, as well, and how that's kind of. Uh, you know, the filters that are through that and how that's aged almost, you know, even though it's ahead of our time now and the music that you've used in that sort of thing to kind of almost set up kind of, I guess, the, the, the time between now and where the film is set sort of thing. That must be quite fun to almost kind of play with, you know, the imagination of what these robots are doing and what they could possibly do from now to then. Yeah, there's, so there's, you need to do science fiction, the big problem is you've got this gap between today and when the film begins, and everybody has a million questions about that gap. It's really annoying when you're trying to get the film done, because everybody just wants to know everything about what happened, and um, I wanted the film to feel, like, you know, it doesn't make sense logically, but at the beginning you've got this archive of the past, you know, which is our future, but weirdly, even having that um, general come up and do the speech, um, he, making that look like archive, it made no sense whatsoever, but it sort of felt right. because so I wanted it to feel to the audience like, that's what's happened, like that's the past, and, and now we're in the present and off we go. And, and so it's, it's a very retro future. Um, it's like, you know, the future I grew up being promised in a brochure and it never happened. And so this is me, you know, 
sort of like trying to and having a little fantasy. Yeah, like it. Um, this is we've got something from France as well. What were the inspirations you took to build the world of the creator in terms of films? Um, no name on that one. Um, France. They're really obvious, but the ones I probably would point out the most are Apocalypse Now, Blade Runner, Akira, Lone Wolf and Cub, and Baraka. If I was to name five, I could keep going. But. That's good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is from the Tech Chap in London, who says, favourite sci-fi movies growing up? For me, Minority Report. Growing up? Yeah. I know exactly. Why I was like thirty up? when that came out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> growing up, well, the obvious, you know. Um, when did sci-fi first connect with you? It was there before anything else, before the real world was. Like yeah. I watched Star Wars to death on the Betamax tape every morning. My dad can testify to that. <laughs> and um, on loop constantly. And and to me, that was the world. And then it was kind of depressing to learn that it wasn't true. And the world was a little bit boring, <laughs> and and so and that was all a lie called cinema. And so then it was like, okay, well, if, if I can't become Luke Skywalker and join the Rebel Alliance, then I'm going to become a liar, like George Lucas, and, <laughs> and make up shit the little kids to get disappointed about. And so it was that, um, yeah, you know, Close Encounters, Blade Runner. Actually, you know what? Blade Runner was later in life. Mm -hmm. I didn't appreciate it as a kid. Um, Aliens, I probably discovered before Alien, but as an adult, Alien is pretty up there. Um, all the obvious ones, really. Yeah. Um, this is another one from France, but no name. The movie is an ambitious project made to be seen on the big screen. When you were writing it, did you want to offer the audience the full movie theatre experience? Yeah, it took me seven years to do this film. Um, and I was kind of, it's half laziness and a little bit of the pandemic. But it was because I wanted to do something like this, you know, where you had a bit of freedom and you could do a big theatrical release. And it's nothing against television, like some of my best friends at TV sets. But I really, really, really wanted to put something on the big screen. Um, and thank God I got the opportunity with New Regency, um, who are a very filmmaker friendly uh, studio. And I just hope, you know, it's a big swing. Like, um, original sci-fi blockbustery films are not, you know, it's all, it's a, it's a democracy and, and you vote with your cinema ticket. And so, you know, we'll see what happens. But um, basically, Hollywood just makes whatever people go see. So if whatever you like, whatever kind of movie it is, please go support it at the theater. What makes a company a filmmaker friendly? Oh, um, you don't, you never get that really annoying note that ruins the whole movie for you and the reason you're doing it. And also they, they, you know, to be honest, I, one of the things that happened, which is really good, is I guess in post-production, you spend about a third of it making your film mm -hmm. and you spend about two thirds of it just showing it people and listening to feedback. And there's a point where the studio, everybody goes, it doesn't really matter what one person thinks. It's what, like, if you get, if you hear the same note by 20 people or 10 people in a massive screening, then then go and try and solve it. And no one would tell us how to solve it. They were just like, you gotta solve that. And and we were left alone to kind of figure out ideas and try and come up with fixes, and then we'd do another screening and kind of work like that. And it, it was a really good scenario, I think. Do you enjoy that side of it? The kind of almost, you know, that finding the film, finding another version of the film, I guess, in the edit, you know, in terms of feeling it in that sense? Um, yeah, I mean, okay, so the first cut of this movie was just under five hours. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see it next week. <laughs> Before we move. Yeah, and um, uh, there's the crew here that probably sat going, where's the scene that I nearly died trying to film with the, the so-and-so thing? Um, yeah, it was, it was a game of Jenga, just removing things, really, without it collapsing. Um, it was, and I think we got most of the movie in there. Like there was always times where it's like, oh, I really regret that not being in there. And Hank Corwin, who's one of our main editors, if someone had asked me before I made this film, what are the two best edited movies in the world? I would have gone, I'm really torn. It's either JFK or The Tree of Life. I just love the way that those are edited. And Hank did both of those. And so I was really blessed. And so it was like, um, it was like this game where we would just try and take pieces out and 
he would do really crazy ways of compressing story. Um, like just jump, like there was no rules. You know, like normally you think, well, you can't do that. And you'd be like, why not? And then he would do it, do something really random that was crazy. And it's something like, oh, it kind of works. And um, so, yeah, it's like working as a team uh, with Scott Morris as well. The three of us were kind of locked in a room for like nine months, just trying to like get this down to two hours. And finding beautiful things in the edit as well. Talked about that scene earlier today about Madeline that was that you kind of forgotten that you'd yeah. filmed and it's such a beautiful and important part of the film as well, if you don't mind talking about that. Yeah, I, well, got the idea for the film. There's lots of different things that came, but one of them was on a driving with my girlfriend across America to her parents in Iowa. It was like a three or four day road trip. And I don't know, I was probably being a bit antisocial. I put some headphones on and <laughs> listening to music, looking out the window. And you've got all this farmland scrolling past. And I wanted to do a robot movie of some, some kind. And I saw this factory in the middle of all this farmland. And it looked like a Japanese logo. And I was like, oh, I wonder what they're doing in there. And I was like, oh, maybe robots. You know, that'd be cool. And, and then I was like, God, oh, imagine being a robot. And you walked out of the building for the first time and there was grass in the sky. I wonder what you'd make of it. And I was like, oh, it's a nice little scene in a movie, but I don't know where that goes. And I threw it away like you do. I carried on thinking about something else. And it was like it tapped me on the shoulder and went, oh, what if they're all trying to kill the robots? You know, and she escaped or something. And I was like, oh yeah, okay. And then carried on thinking about it. And then suddenly like, oh, you could do your lone wolf and cub thing with this one. <laughs> And all these, it just sort of grew. And then by the time we got to her parents, I kind of had the whole movie roughly mapped out in my head. And that normally never happens. Normally it takes months to kind of click into place. I thought, oh, that's either like a really good sign or a really bad one, I wasn't sure which. And then when you were filming, you had this moment with Madeline that was an absolute connection to that. Yeah, thought. so we were, we were, the guys will know this. It takes a while, so in the lab raid, um, when they are attacking all the lab people and they're running out in the field. There was a giant explosion at one point. There was a few explosions in this film. There was a giant explosion. They were setting up the explosion. I don't know what they're doing. It was something where they needed like 20 minutes, half an hour, and it felt like a crime not to be filming. And there was some light switched on, and I was like, Madeline, do you want to come? Like, I just filmed some stuff. And she's like, yeah. Just grab the camera, and we go off in the field. I'm just talking to her, going, okay, walk forwards, look back. Okay, okay, what's that? You know, and she just looked around and just got all this material of her walking around and forgot about it. And we carried on with the, what we, the plan was. And then we were in the edit and Hank was messing around with me. So he landed on that shot randomly as he's trying to find something. And I was like, oh, that's the whole reason I wanted to make this film. And he's like, what? And I was like, you know, the moment that the kid first comes out and I explained it to him and he was like, that's beautiful. You gotta put that in. And I was like, yeah, but how does it fit in? He went, I'll do it. And he starts just banging it together and creates that moment. And it's there's so many moments like that in filmmaking where, God, if I hadn't said that sentence, or if that person hadn't walked over there, or if I hadn't leaned against that window, you know what I mean? Whatever it is, the whole thing's just serendipity. Like, you know, it's kind of very scary, like when you look back. And um, this is a lovely question that's coming from Jeremy. What advice would you give to young filmmakers who also want to tell stories of fantastic fictional worlds? Don't worry, AI is coming. <laughs> you won't need a camera or actors or anything. Um, sorry, I don't know where that came from. Um, I think uh, I would say um, uh, fail a lot. Everything I did for a very long time, and maybe still is, who knows, was shit. And, and I, you just got to get the bad ones out. And then eventually it starts, you start being a bit better. And so just don't put it off. I put it off making a film. I was 35 when I made my first film and I played that game like, like an idiot, like a lot of people did, where you look on IMDb and your heroes and Steven Spielberg like made his first film when he was 26, my like, bastard. <laughs> and then, and then like, and you keep it, one at a time, like, oh, James Cameron's gone, I'm now 32, I can't do it. And then suddenly you get like, oh, I can still beat Ridley Scott. <laughs> and, and then, and, and so I felt like I left it really late and I was always an excuse like, there's a, some stupid reason not to do it. Oh, there's a new camera coming out next year or there's this or there's that. And it's like, just go do it and fail. Like, the, it gets to a point, I guess, with anybody where the fear of failure is worse than like the, feel, the fear of never having tried or whatever. And like, you just reach a tipping point where you sort of go, I've got to just chance this. 
um, else I'll never be able to live with myself, you know. A um, couple more questions that are coming in, but I wanted to ask you about the music in the film because there's lots of different um, ways that it's used. Claire de Lune would be great to, to talk about, but the needle drops in there, and then working with Hans Zimmer on, on a score that's kind of really minimalist almost for, you know, for, for Hans. But talk yeah. about that. Can you talk about Claire de Lune first and why that track it appears a couple of times in the film? No, I'm actually going to talk about Joan Walker, <laughs> yes. the editor that uh, helped assemble the movie whilst we were filming. Because Joe put this nearly five hour cut together with no music whatsoever. And it was, when you sit down and watch an assembly for the first time, it's the worst point in the life of a movie. It's when the film is, no offense to anybody, but like when you picture a film, when you start picturing a film, when you're in like pre production and writing a script, it gets better and better and better as you're like getting ideas. Oh, we can go here and do this. And you start designing it and anything. And it gets to the point where it's a masterpiece in your mind. And then you start filming and it gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. <laughs> and by the end of the shoot, you think you've destroyed your career and that's the end of everything. And then you're in the edit and it gets better and better and better. And you try to, you know, a masterpiece movie obviously gets higher or as high as the original. And so you're just trying to get as high as you can at the end. And so the worst point on that graph is the first day of the edit where you sit down, you watch an assembly. And I always say, look, if I, at the end of this screening, I haven't committed suicide, that's a win. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, and basically Joe had done the whole thing with no music and it kind of worked. And, and that's how they used to make films in the eighties. And we were trying to make that kind of movie like when they were editing on a Steam Deck and everything, they didn't have all these tracks. So it was all silent, you know, it wasn't really like music or anything. And so it forces, you can't hide behind the music to make things like sound great. And so for the longest time we were like, you know what, let's stop, let's not put music in, let's just keep going. And so we kept editing without any music for a very long time. And then as a result, what was great is then when we finally showed it to Hans Zimmer, um, it didn't need that much. There's only an hour of music in this. Normally it's wall to wall, like for a two hour movie, but there's only an hour of hands, if you want to call it that. Hour of hands, <laughs> I like that a lot. Do you think that you've set a precedence with how you've, you know, we were talking about earlier about the kind of re reverse kind of process of, of filmmaking. You talked about that sweet spot in the middle of, you know, independent film to kind of blockbusters, that it can be done. And just how extraordinary this film is and what you did it for. Do you think it's kind of almost I don't know, opening up a new door in a way of, of kind of what can be done in, in that bracket. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> like, I, I mean, I would like, I want to, if I make another film, I, would, I, I don't want to go back. I want to kind of make things this kind of way, yeah. push it even further. Um, but that's me. Everyone has their own way of making a movie and it's, you know, that everyone's got a unique voice. And so, yeah, I wouldn't say this is the way anyone should do it, do a movie, but I think it's closer to how I want to do it than I've ever got. And that kind of process of pushing things forward, I mean, you, you've kind of built your own cameras and stuff and things on this one as well. When, at what point do you know you've got to do that, you know, in terms of like, I'm going to design a lightweight camera that I need to make this film sort of thing? Is that, that's going to be done before you arrive on set and before you start shooting sort of thing. So when are you starting that process of, you know, of almost building your own tech for? I started doing that straight after Rogue One. I was like, I just got paranoid I was never going to get to make a film again. And I was like, I'm going to just build my own thing. I'm going to try and figure out how to do this on my own. So if no one gives me the money, I'm going to go shoot something you know, my own way. And so it was like out of pure fear of not getting anyone writing a check. And it was like, I'm just going to figure this out myself. And so, yeah, I just started getting, there was, there was new technology as well, new gimbals, new cameras. But it was shot with a 1970s, anamorphic lens so it has that sort of 70s vibe about it but um and whatever camera we used you know every year it gets better and the technology and the gimbals and the drones you know get easier and so it's kind of like what, what's coming is pretty exciting like there's you don't need tens of millions of dollars to make a film anymore um i hope you get a moment to enjoy you know the response that this film is already getting it's it's not even kind of you know out to the to the public properly this week, but already it's just getting such a great response. And I hope you allow yourself the 
the joy of, of appreciating that just for a minute. I know you won't, but but you should for sure. Um, thank you so much for being here and, and answering our questions. Thanks to everybody here at the BFI IMAX, to everybody watching well, thank you. and viewing. And a round of applause to the crew. There is, I haven't seen them since Thailand, but there's a load of credits that we took short of all the amazing, talented people. They're in the room somewhere. You know where you are. Thank you, thank you. The film's out this week. Um, I can't wait to go and see it again. A huge round of applause for the wonderful Gareth Edwards, everybody. <laughs> Safe film, everyone. Thank you. Give me the mic.